Hi everyone, this is your Unit 2 Biodiversity Test Review video. Um, please keep in mind with this test, you will need to make sure you know definitions and concepts and be able to apply them. So this test is going to be a little bit more than just memorizing uh, the bold definitions. We also need to make sure you very clearly know the concepts, which I have reviewed throughout these slides. All right, we're going to start with evolution, since a lot of biodiversity comes from how much evolution has taken place over time and how much speciation has taken place in an ecosystem. So first of all, the definition of evolution that you should be familiar with is the genetic changes in a population of species over time. Um, so we might look at a species of orca and see how those orca have accumulated mutations that they've passed down to their offspring uh, and how those mutations have either become more common, less common, or have been eliminated within the population. You should know that a mutation is a genetic change in DNA, um, and those occur randomly. Um, they can help encourage evolution. They can be good, bad, or neutral, and we do not get mutations just because we want them. Um, adaptations are inherited traits that help an organism survive better. So an organism could have a mutation that eventually becomes an adaptation for it if it is a beneficial trait that helps it survive. Um, natural selection is going to be the process that helps drive evolution within an ecosystem. So basically you have some organisms that are going to be better adapted at survival, some that will have better traits that will help them survive, and they are going to most likely reproduce more often. Basically if they live a long time and they make lots of babies, they're going to be doing a good job of surviving um, and driving evolution within their ecosystem. Uh, and then coevolution is uh, an example where we have two populations of species, for example, the poisonous newt and the poison resistant snake that we looked at in the video in class, where they're actually driving each other's evolution. Um, and they referred to that in the video as an evolutionary arms race, because as the newt got stronger in its toxin, the snake became more resistant. And over time, they just kind of kept pushing each other's evolution along. We also discussed different types of selection that can occur. The example we used in class was the rock pocket mice. You guys did the graphing with that, and we were looking at the changes in the darker and lighter mice populations, how many were found on the darker and lighter habitats. Um, so obviously your lighter mice are probably going to survive a little better and be more adapted to surviving on the lighter habitat, where the darker mice preferred the darker one um, because they were better able to survive. And their evolution was kind of driven by their predator, um, which is technically a form of coevolution. So if we look at our diagrams here, you should be able to identify the different types of selection. You can see the original population, a moderate um, kind of medium color was considered the um, most common in the original population with less on the two extremes of the much lighter and much darker mice. If you have a selective pressure such as the habitat becoming all dark due to some kind of event over time, we might have directional selection where um, if you look at the bottom left graph, uh, the darker mice become more common. And you can see that dark mouse right in here. And you can see with the um, bar, um, I'm sorry, the bell graph increasing at that point and being shifted in one direction, we call it directional selection. Um, we also have diversifying or disruptive selection, the middle one here, and this is where your two extremes, your light mouse and your dark mouse become more common. Um, so you can see it's kind of like pushing the bell down and we diversify um, or in this population, we're basically going to split it to where half becomes light, half becomes dark, and that in-between color kind of goes away. Or you can have stabilizing selection where kind of that moderate middle mouse, um, uh, the medium color becomes more common and we see an increase in its population and pretty much we lose out on those darker and lighter colored mice. Make sure for this one you do know the types of selection by name and what they look like. You will have to be able to identify them. You're also going to need to know your types of speciation that can occur. Um, speciation is just when you have a population ends up breaking into two populations in some way and they genetically diverge over time. Usually what happens is you get the populations no longer mating with each other. Um, this is probably a little bit more common in animal populations just because of behaviors, but it could potentially happen uh, in tree populations as well, especially if you have something like allopatric speciation which is our one on, a on the left here. Notice that we have a barrier, in this case, the 
crevice or crack or river, or it could be a mountain range, dividing the population. And so they are no longer able to reach the other side, so they cannot really mate easily together. Um, this is probably again more common in animals than plants because plants um, are sometimes able to have their seeds spread by various mechanisms. Um, but if you have a population that is physically divided by some kind of geographic barrier, again, river, mountain, crevice, etc., um, then it will likely diverge over time and become new species. And you can see our two species of trees in that second picture. Sympatric speciation occurs when species are not separated. So if we look at our picture on the right, you can see that population of trees in the middle that something has happened, most likely a mutation, um, where it's changed the genetics of the tree enough that it has started to become its own species and over time will diverge fully into its own species. Typically what happens is you have enough changes in the genetics of that new population that it no longer mates back with the original population and we can consider it a new species at that point. Or if they are not able to mate and create viable offspring, they would also be a new species as well. All right, for different types of species, you should know your indicator, foundation, and keystone. So the three that we did for the campaign boasters in class. Um, your indicator species, such as frogs, are species that are kind of early warning systems for scientists. Um, if we start to see decline in those populations, it tells us that something is going on in the environment, probably before other organisms start to decline because of their sensitivity to changes. Foundation species often help build or alter ecosystems. Uh, for example, elephants are known to push over trees, um, create uh, pathways through the savanna, generally alter the ecosystem physically, or help build up an ecosystem, and they are going to be the ones um, affecting other organisms in that way. Keystone species are probably one of our somewhat more important ones, um, they have a huge influence over other species within the ecosystem. And because so many species depend on them, if they were to disappear, it would be um, devastating for the rest of the ecosystem. We talked about otters uh, and the fact that they help keep urchins under control, which allows kelp to continue to thrive um, while keeping everything kind of balanced out. But if otters were to decline, urchins would go up and then kelp would probably be decimated. Um, and then we would lose not only a food source and a producer for the food web of that ecosystem, but also a habitat for a number of organisms as well. Other examples of keystone species are things like gopher tortoises. Um, they are a common one in Florida. You should also make sure you know the difference between generalist and specialist species. Uh, generalist species would be things like mice, cockroaches, even humans could qualify here um, because they occupy a broad niche or space in the ecosystem. Um, they are not super picky about the food they eat, they're not super picky about their habitat, or they're able to cope and withstand varying conditions. Whereas specialist species like our little koala down here are very picky about what they eat or where they live, and they tend to be pretty sensitive to changes. So you can see the little bit of um, eucalyptus hanging out of that koala's mouth. They are very picky about their food sources, just like pandas are with bamboo. And so if they end up losing their food source or losing their habitat, specialist species tend to decline. Um, and also specialist species are not going to deal well with competition. If a generalist species were to start competing, uh, for the same resource that a specialist species has to have to survive, those specialist species are probably not going to do very well. Um, we might see them decline. We might see the generalist species outcompete them. Um, so that could potentially be devastating to the specialist species population. You should know your differences between primary and secondary succession. Um, these are the notes that we did on Wednesday. I had you guys draw some pictures. I would definitely refer back to those and some of the notes we made. Um, big, big difference here to watch out for is the soil and no soil. So primary succession, there's no soil typically to begin with, and your pioneer species such as lichen and moss need to create the soil. So it makes this a much slower, longer process. Usually what causes primary succession is gonna be volcanoes or glacier recession, where the glacier had been there for thousands of years and is now exposing brand new uh, rocky habitat underneath where it was. Um, we'll have those end with a climax community, which is basically a mature, stable community. So definitely know your pioneer species term and your climax community term. Secondary uh, succession is usually going to take place due to fires or maybe even abandoned agricultural fields. Um, you can have plants grow back much quicker with secondary succession because soil is immediately available. We don't have to wait for it to be made. Eventually, secondary succession will lead to a climax community as well, um, but is going to generally, again, be much faster than primary succession. All right, if you take a look at our differences between primary and secondary here, primary succession in that top picture, notice that the um, first chunk of that is your pioneer species moving into the area. So plants um, 
lichens, moss. Um, the lichens and moss often make the soil, and then you'll have grasses and flowers and whatnot grow back. Then we'll usually see trees uh, come back in until it becomes a more mature climax community. You see at the bottom, secondary succession, we pretty much get plants coming back right away um, because soil is already there. We don't have to wait for the soil to be formed, so it's a much quicker process. Pertaining to uh, succession and disturbances, you should know that um, habitats can actually withstand a moderate amount uh, of disturbance. Too little disturbance or too much disturbance really doesn't help increase biodiversity, um, but there is research and evidence that shows that actually a little bit of disturbance can help increase the number of species that come into an area. Um, so think of it like if you have a bit of a disturbance, maybe a moderate forest fire, not a humongous devastating one, but a, a medium. Um, affect one on the environment, then new species will move in to recolonize afterwards. So every time that happens, you might get more species coming into the area. Um, whereas a low amount of disturbance, you might not normally see a lot of species moving into the ecosystem. High amounts of disturbance, though, can eventually lead to extinction, so it's generally not um, a good thing for the habitat. Since I mentioned biodiversity, um, you should probably know a few of the definitions. Um, so what biodiversity is in general is uh, the basically number of species within an ecosystem. So how many plants, how many animals, even how many bacteria are found there could be the species diversity or biodiversity of the ecosystem. Um, there are two parts of that. There are species richness, which is your actual number of species. Is there 50 species? Is there a thousand species? Um, or is there only five? And then species evenness, which is the distribution of the species or how abundant they are. So for example, the rainforest, if you take a look at that picture, um, which is our top one, you notice there's lots of different species. Um, no one species really dominates over the other ones. Whereas if you look at the pine forest, it would have much lower species evenness. Um, notice that the pine trees that are there are really the dominant species in that ecosystem. The rest of the species are kind of minor in comparison, and that would be your species evenness. So you could have habitats um, that have plenty of species, but you could have one that really dominates over the other one, and that's going to show you your difference in species evenness. That would be low evenness, again, in the case of the pine forest. For island biodiversity, make sure you are just familiar with the general patterns of what happens as organisms move um, out from the mainland and migrate to the islands. So for example, if you have organisms coming out from the mainland to the islands, you're going to have a number of them move out to larger islands, especially if they're closer. So notice the big bar we have right here. Usually larger islands mean higher numbers of species. Notice the small one, it has a smaller bar because you're going to have fewer species move out to that island. Even if they're um, at exactly the same distance from the mainland, generally that larger island is going to have a higher diversity there. Um, so you see island area or size, the number of species increases. So you see increasing with the island area. If you have islands that are closer or further away, the further away you are, the fewer species you'll have going out there. So nearer means more species and larger means more species, okay, so near and large, whereas smaller or further away, or a combination of both, is usually going to mean less diversity on those islands. So notice number of species, distance from mainland, the further away you get, your number of species actually declines. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that larger islands also have higher rates of migration. Um, of new species to the island from the mainland than do smaller islands and islands further away. All right, last thing we need to review is range of tolerance. Um, this is talking about the different types of um, changes in an ecosystem that organisms can withstand. So for example, their optimum range um, might be a certain range of temperatures that they function just fine with and they're happy with that. It doesn't affect them in any negative way. Um, once we get out to this zone of physiological stress, it basically is a fancy way of saying that super high or super low temperature they don't like very much. And then if we go even higher or even lower than that, um, the organism can become um, pretty much eliminated from that area. So notice there's no fish here or here. Basically, it's outside of their range of tolerance. So we have kind of the happy place for the organisms. Wow, that's a really ugly smiley face. We have the meh place for the organisms. They're okay with it. It's not the best. And we have the no-go 
area for the organisms. So this could have to do with temperature, it could have to do with salinity, how much salt's in the water, um, it could have to do with dissolved oxygen, um, or it could have to do with pH. There's a number of different environmental factors, usually abiotic, that could affect whether or not organisms can tolerate that habitat. All right, thank you for listening to our video. Um, I hope that it is going to be helpful for you for the test. Um, Make sure that you've completed all the questions in order to get your extra credit. I'm also going to put up the YouTube link on Canvas, and you guys can reference that if you want to watch the video again without having to watch it in Canvas. Um, make sure you study, and good luck!